Now welcome to another news from Naboo with Thor's Lightning Takes. And let's get right to the news. All right, we're going to kind of go over an interview that Tony Gilroy did with The Hollywood Reporter, kind of talking about some season finale stuff and breaking down a little bit of information on the timeline for season two. So in this first part, we may have minor spoilers. For the finale of Andor? Yes. We're going to have some spoilers in there. I'm not going to say minor, because I don't know what's major and minor all the time. I don't know. Everything in the show is major. (laughs) After episode 11, we'll start out with uh, some people speculated, some uh, that Marva wasn't dead because we didn't see the body, and in Star Wars, (laughs) you you don't believe anyone is dead anymore. Even when you see the body, it doesn't always mean they're dead. The theory was that Marva faked her death to rally the troops against the Empire, and this was not ultimately the case. Gilroy actually went back and he said he liked the idea after he saw it online. Really? He did. He said, I heard that theory. I heard that theory and I was like, oh my god. That's a legit idea. I was like, wow. They snuck the body out. They did the whole thing. That's so legit. (laughs) But no, Marvel was absolutely dead. I, for one, I think that's cool that he actually kind of listens to theories and acknowledges yeah. them. I, we've seen some creators kind of make fun of theories in mm-hmm. the past. But also, I kind of thought that was a little cliche, wasn't it? It's like, oh, she's, you know. It's a, I, but it's an interesting idea. No, it's not, a, it's not that it was a bad idea. It just feels like this show is trying to avoid maybe, you know, very cliche things. Yep, but he, know, he acknowledged that it was, it, was a, it was a legit idea. You know, and when I hear, like, Marva still being alive, I like to see her, like, popping out of the coffin with, you know, machine guns and blasting. <laughs> story. You know, like, something, she, I guess that's part of my problem. I'm seeing something yeah, really you're cheesy not something, out of it. Like, if he would have done it, it would have been a very well thought yeah, out moment. Yeah, it wouldn't have been. Moment, and we were in, like... Like, oh, ooh, yeah. sneaky. Yeah, it wouldn't have been quite where my head was. And, and uh, not that I thought it was would really be something like that, but that's kind of how I, it, it kind of sometimes is mm-hmm. really cheesy when someone's like not dead and then they come back. And Tony Gilroy goes on to talk about how Luthen had a pretty good day on Ferrix. He says, yeah, it's a big day for Luthen. When he's listening to Marva's speech, it's not pride of ownership on his part. It is and it isn't. But it's another corner of the farm he's trying to grow. So he's very proud when he hears that. And my god, to finish up the day and have this new asset walk in who's been through all this stuff and is still standing and you man- and you managed not to kill. And he is now basically saying, all right, I'm in. Blood oath. That's a pretty good day, I think. It was a very good day for him. I, I originally thought he was kind of listening to everything and... Because he has this really peculiar look on his face during the whole thing. Yeah, kind of a almost a almost a smile. It's almost almost a smile, but it's almost some level of like, huh? So this is this is what it actually looks like. Right, like I'm. This is me in there watching a community rise yeah. up. Thing that he himself didn't really have a hand in. No, well, he. I mean, almost indirectly because <laughs> you know, Aveldani and Cassian inspires his mother. But mm-hmm. it's it's almost like he realizes that. You know, okay, we can go do the Aldani heist, and it's kind of this thing that the Empire says is bad, and it maybe inspires some people, mm-hmm. but it doesn't have a face. Marva has, obviously, Marva has a face. She is talking directly to the people. She is reaching their heart. You're right, and he did say he his goal were to get the Empire to squeeze harder to make people rise up. Yeah. And that's what she's talking about in her speech. Yeah. It's, it's not that he, you know, it's so weird, because in a way, he is responsible for the Marva thing, but he can't... He can't be that face. He can't be that person mm-hmm. that stands up and actually inspires the actual yeah. rebellion. So he's actually seeing the fruits of his labor. Yeah. And he's there firsthand. And I, yeah, there's got to be some pride there. There's pride in that. Yet there's, I think he realizes maybe this is how it actually needs this to happen. This is how it actually will go. His behind yeah. the scenes this stuff is, yeah. is making this. This is what actually needs to happen. The inspiration. Yeah. You need these people who are going to be the face of your rebellion. Not the mm-hmm. people who do a, a heist on Eldani and steal a bunch of credits and probably get people, yeah, stick it to the Empire until mm-hmm. the Empire sticks it back. But but as he told Mon Mothma, he needs the Empire to squeeze harder to trigger this reaction. Exactly. So it, it all it all fits together. It's a, it's a perfect little wheel, you could say. <laughs> and he's watching it in real time. <laughs> And that probably definitely excited him to some extent to see yeah. that what he's doing is having an effect. Yeah, and then you have Andor coming in like, you know, hey, kill me or take me in. I'm, I'm, I'm yours in not that, that weird sort of way. That's a powerful moment, but yeah. yeah. But no, it's it's one of the most powerful moments in Star Wars for me. Just you see someone who has been through hell and is like, I am I am in. <laughs> I don't care about anything else. And, and he knows it. Luthan knows, like, I got him. I got him. Even yeah. though I was going to kill him about five minutes ago. But he's also seeing so much value. Like, he's been eluding me for how long? He doesn't know that he was in jail. He was, <laughs> yeah. He's been eluding he me know, for yeah. so long. And 
Yeah, he probably he probably is impressed with Andor right mm-hmm. now. Like, how oh, this guy was off the grid for a month. In a different part of the galaxy, Mon Mothma is not having such a great day. Gilroy confirmed in this interview that she did fabricate the story about her husband's gambling being behind the missing money in her account, and then added the following when asked why she decided to go through with her daughter's marriage. She's just trying to cover all the tracks. Skulden originally came in and said, oh, I know your husband. That is Davo, the yeah. gangster. So in the end, Skulden probably thinks that this is really about her husband's gambling debts that she's trying to cover. He doesn't know the, what the real purposes are. But what I'm saying here is that she's covering all the bases. If anyone comes looking, if anybody's wondering why she might be borrowing money, or if Skulden is wondering why she might be borrowing money, she can lay it all on poor Perrin. I know. That's a terrible scene in a way. It is. I was sad because I saw some videos or articles misinterpreting that, like, oh, oh, Perrin's gambling. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 no. No. Because she knows the driver is listening. Mon Mothma through Genevieve O'Reilly there was so convincing that people were like, my God, Perrin's gambling again? <laughs> no, no. I mean, he might be, but... But he's not. That's not yeah, it's that's not, not, not exactly the what the scene is implying. He's she's really up using, in arms and he's really legitimately angry yeah, because... because he's not doing it. He's I mean, he's not probably, doing he, it. he might be, which would be kind of funny, but he's probably not gambling. But I gambling. think she would have yeah. known if he really yeah. was. The whole point is she's setting him up or setting, giving a, yep. a scapegoat, you could say, for her if own If someone activities. comes looking for the money and what is she she doing about yes. this money and be like well she's trying to cover for her husband yes clever clever. it's extremely clever but it's brutal because mm-hmm. you're, you're hanging your husband out to dry he was also asked about the post credit scene which finally revealed what the prisoners at narkia 5 were building gilroy said that the death star will still be a looming threat happening in the background of the second season he says it still be a looming threat rogue one is all about discovering what it is season two is about who picks up the final breadcrumbs that lead to the beginning of Rogue One. In Rogue One, Cassian goes to the Ring of Kafreen to meet Tivik, who is from Saw's group, and he says, Oh my god, it's a planet killer. Cassian knows some stuff, but he's looking for answers. So we'll cover the breadcrumbs that lead up to that shore. But we have a situation where Cassian will never know what he was building is actually the machine that's going to kill him. Yeah, I thought that was a perfect... Mm-hmm. Ending. I mean, we, a lot of people, I think, suspected what it was going to be. Yes. But it's still... But it's still a powerful moment to just see it. Yeah, to see he helped build it, and then it's going to... It's going to oh, kill, kill, kill him, and he's help, going to help destroy it. So it's this weird it's weird twist of fate and irony, and I don't know. It's poetry. It rhymes. I know there were some fans upset, because we didn't see what happened to Anto Krieger on the screen. We didn't see the Empire. We didn't see the space battle. Yeah. There were people upset. Well, Tony Gilroy tells us why we didn't see it. Because it was a massacre? (laughs) Well, in the grammar of our show, I probably wouldn't have shown the Krieger ambush. Our grammar is pretty rigorous. Without establishing Krieger as a speaking character, as someone that we've been with, or some other peripheral character who's there or something, I probably wouldn't. We wouldn't go anywhere one of our characters isn't walking us into. The Death Star Easter egg aside, in a few extreme cases like that, Even with our camera, our grammar is very rigorous about what we allow ourselves to do in the perspective we're allowed to have. So, probably not. So, basically, no emotional stakes, no reason to show it. I mean, we don't know who... I mean, we know Krieger through other characters, but we don't know Krieger. He's not a speaking part. Like, it would have been different if Saw's group would have shown up. We may have seen it because we have followed Saw a little. Yeah. But if Luthen wasn't there, if Cassian wasn't there, none of our big characters are there, so why would we be there? I feel like a lot of shows or movies would use it as an excuse for a spectacle. And he's like, no, there's there's no... Without the substance behind it, as I often say, there's no need for a spectacle. Right, it would be a spectacle for spectacle's sake. Yeah. And that's something he seems very against. Yeah, which I'm cool with. I love mm-hmm. spectacle. Don't get me... I've said it before. Like, lightsabers, space battles, it's all great. Love that stuff. It's a big part of Star Wars. But when it doesn't have any emotional stakes behind it, when it's not mm-hmm. set up, what's the point? Right. Composer Nicholas Bratel had said in an earlier interview that we kind of covered that some of the work he did for the score on the series was meant to be played on set. In episode 12, we saw the music that was played on set. set. Gilroy confirmed this was the first part of the score they got done. Very first thing (laughs) they did. And then that happened six months before the rest of the music. So that was like the first thing they shot, was the music on 
barracks. And yeah, for the in funeral, person, yeah. live. There they were playing the music, and that's kind of cool. It is really cool. Like I know really some of the actors too. had commented on that, saying it was such an experience to have that music right there. Yeah, because you it gets you. I mean, every little thing you can you know actually have there physically, realistically it has to help. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I do wonder. I mean, with so much shot practically with this show. I mean, does is that part of the difference? Was that part of the difference in the acting? Could be. Moving on to season two, we know that each block will be three episodes and each covering a year between the events of season one and the beginning of Rogue One. Gilroy confirmed each block will be contained, covering a handful of days each of those years before jumping forward another year. He says, they're actually super condensed. Three days, four days, two weeks, four days... They're really tight. It's cool that way. That's what's exciting about it. You can go away for a year, come back for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, then jump a year. So they won't be spread out. It won't be like block two takes place over another year. They're very concentrated, which is fun. And then you have to account for all the negative space and what happened in the interim. Yeah, I think the original plan must have been to take those condensed stories and spread them over a year. When they were originally well, going to do five seasons. Maybe condensed is better. I mean, we well, maybe might see be. every day in a year. Well, I mean, at this I mean, point, I wouldn't mind it. this story takes place over, one could say, a condensed period of time over one year. Yeah, but, I mean, it was so good. Like, if the other seasons were on this level, which probably would be, I would have been would have been quite fine with five mm-hmm. or four more seasons of Andor. I would have, too, as long as Tony Gilroy didn't get burned out. Yeah, that, that's another key. Because you could have, you know, Game of Thrones syndrome where you get... You do it for four or five years, and then you can tell the quality level drops off a little bit as they get tired of it, right? Gilroy was then asked for a small tease about what's to come. He says, We'll be dealing with, by the time you get to Rogue One, you have the Rebel Alliance, which is a bunch of different, disparate factions and people that have arrived at Yavin and have coalesced into what they will become an organized rebellion. We'll have four years to examine how difficult it is to put a revolution together, how difficult it is to become a leader, how difficult it is to be a victim. But what happens to the original gangsters? What happens to the outliers? What happens to the people who were... Every revolution consumes people and glorifies people, and not always the people that did the thing that mattered. How do you scale up something that essentially does not thrive in sunshine? How do you do that? And those issues and all the chaos that's going to be of great interest to us going forward. Duncan Pow, who plays Melshi, will be back. Obviously, we're playing there with that because he's going to be in Rogue One. Which is cool. He was a surprise. Yes. I like that there was some surprise, you know, just totally unexpected things like that. Mm-hmm. The second season is currently filming in the UK. It will be directed by all new people. Originally, we heard some of the directors were coming back. Now we're hearing none of the directors mm. are coming back. When asked why none of the original ones were coming back, he kind of explained this. He says, man, we tried really hard. Ben Caro didn't want to come back because he had his movie with Julian Moore. He's a big feature director now, so he wants to see how this feature goes. We also wanted Toby Haynes to come back really, really badly. But he got jammed up on Black Mirror, so he couldn't give us a decision in time and we had to pull the trigger. It's very hard getting directors. There's a lot of people who are shopping for the same people all the time, and there's only a certain number of people. It's not easy to do this show. You can't learn on this job, and we can't take big chances with these blocks. People have to be pretty experienced, and so that's a smaller group. There's a billion shows, and everybody is scrounging for people. It's a lot of work getting directors. It was way more difficult than I ever thought. I mean, it makes sense. So many streaming services, so many movies, so many everything. Well, he says, like you said, this one you you don't go into and you're like learning the ropes of being a director. He needs seasoned, yeah, well, yeah. sharp people. No, I'm, I'm cool with that. All right, well, that is all we got for you this time. So do take to the comments below. Tell us what you thought of what Tony Gilroy had to say here. What did you think about his comments about the finale? And what do you think about his comments about season two? And are you excited for it or as excited as I am for it? Whatever the case may be, leave your comments below. Let's talk some Star Wars. And until next time, thanks for watching.